Hello, and welcome to the Songwriters Workshop. This is the series where I attempt to write songs based on the process and techniques of famous songwriters. Each video looks at a different songwriter's writing habits, musical inspirations, and creative process, while also including an original song written using those techniques. So let's take a look at our next songwriter. This video will be looking at one of my favorite songwriters, Randy Newman. Randy grew up in New Orleans and Los Angeles and is the nephew of nine-time Oscar-winning composer Alfred Newman. As a child, he befriended Lenny Warrenker, and both would eventually find jobs on Frank Sinatra's record label, Reprise, Randy as a songwriter, and Lenny as an A&R man and producer. Randy even got a chance to pitch his song Lonely at the Top to be recorded by Sinatra, but Old Blue Eyes turned him down. Randy would, however, release his first self-titled album with Reprise in 1968, with Lenny and fellow songwriter Van Dyke Parks as producers. Randy would continue to release albums through the late 60s to the early 70s to a small audience, but his songs would find a greater success in the hands of others, most notably Three Dog Nights' version of Mama Told Me Not To Come in 1970, and various renditions of I Think It's Going To Rain Today, by people like Dusty Springfield, Nina Simone, and Neil Diamond. Randy, however, would receive his first moderately successful release in 1974 with his album Good Old Boys. This concept album about the South would garner Randy a cult following, one he would try to grow with his next album Little Criminals, and its lead single Short People, which hit number two in the Billboard charts. I guess uh, people misunderstood me, you know, I, I wasn't joking. Short people really do got no reason to live, you know, they don't. However, for reasons we'll discuss later in the video, Randy would be unable to recreate the mass popularity of short people, and his subsequent albums would go back to being enjoyed by a small but dedicated fan base. It is also around this time that Randy would begin to follow in his uncle's footsteps and work as a film composer. After contributing songs to various TV shows and movies, Randy would get his first chance to contribute a full soundtrack with Norman Lear's film Cold Turkey in 1971. He would find even greater success writing music for Disney Pixar animated films, including supplying the songs and music for Toy Story, A Bug's Life, and Monsters, Inc., the last of which earned him an Oscar for the song If I Didn't Have You. Of course, Randy would continue to write and release albums of his own, including three songbook retrospective albums, and write a musical based on the story of Faust. He released his 11th studio album, Dark Matter, in 2017. Unlike other videos on this channel, the research for this video does not come from an autobiography, since Randy has yet to write one, though I hope he does. Instead, the information will be based on writings by journalists and biographers of Randy's life and music. First is Randy Newman's American Dreams by Kevin Currier. Also known for his biography of Frank Zappa, Courier's book is an in-depth look at a fringe artist and the culture that shaped him. The second biography is Maybe I'm Doing It Wrong, by the husband and wife writing team David and Caroline Stafford. The Staffords are from England, and this biography wonderfully captures the wit and humor of Randy's work. Both books, however, pay homage to the fantastic and insightful essay on Randy, written by Rolling Stones journalist Grill Marcus that can be found in his book, Mystery Train. This book as a whole is some of the best commentary on artists influenced by the American musical, cultural, and socio-political landscape and will make you listen to Randy's music in a whole new way. So let's get started. The first part about understanding how Randy writes his songs, and arguably the most important part, is what Kevin Currier calls in his book, The Mask. In the majority of Randy's songs, he portrays a character, one that often contains an extreme identity trait that is vastly different from Randy himself. In Sail Away, he is a slave runner trying to con Africans to join him on his boat to America. In Rednecks, he is a self-aware bigot who points out that racism is as inherent in the North as it is in the South. And in Davy the Fat Boy, he plays someone who betrays his friend's trust in order to sell his enormous size as a circus sideshow act. Randy says, When you write a song for yourself, people sort of tend to expect the I in the song to be yourself. That's not the case in my songs. I embody in myself the sort of narrow, bigoted, stupid, cowardly, untrustworthy people I portray in my songs, 
but I like to think I'm a bigger person than that. I have talked about taking on the point of view of other people when writing songs in these videos before, but Randy takes it to a whole other level. He not only writes as these characters, he becomes them, fully putting on their masks. As Girl Marcus says, he always writes, and what is harder, sings, in the voice of his characters. No matter what grotesquerie is involved, he does not sing about, he sings as. He feels this is dangerous, which it is. Lenny Warrenker said of watching Randy craft a song, I've seen Randy kill himself over what is basically dialogue, what a character would say, absolutely kill himself to get it right. So he has this uncanny ability to visualize a scene musically and write it from the perspective of a fully realized character. So of course, for my song, I decided to write from the point of view of a character, and like a lot of Randy songs, I tried to pick a character that I would find reprehensible. But that brings me to another important part of Randy's mask, that he not only becomes these often horrible characters, but tries to understand them in his songs. In discussing the song Sail Away, Grill Marcus says, The power of the song is in the simple, perfectly accomplished idea that something so horrible and charged with guilt as slavery could take on such real beauty. The focus is not on those who are to be enslaved, but on the singer, the confidence man. Of course he is lying. He has seen babies thrown into the sea, smelled the death and excrement in the hold, watched the brand burn into flesh. He has looked without flinching into the bewildered eyes that are perhaps the most terrible of all. But for the moment, he believes himself. A secret ambivalence of 400 years of American life finds a voice in this song. It is not particularly liberating, too strange for that. It is like a vision of heaven superimposed on hell. In Randy's best songs, he is able to walk the delicate line of satirizing his subjects without mocking them. He is able to deliver it in such a way that makes the listener think without letting them write it off as a joke or unimportant. And he takes it just far enough without falling into the abyss of outright horror. Randy says, I realize I have to make the uglier observations easy to swallow. If I made the music all spiky, people wouldn't hear what I'm saying. As for my intent, well, I'm not Mary Sunshine, and I'm not particularly optimistic about a lot of things. But what has been taken as nastiness in some of my songs isn't really descriptive of anything, or anyone. It's exaggeration for the sake of satire. Now Randy has strayed across this line a couple of times, most famously with the song Short People, which holds an important lesson for songwriters. After the cult success of Good Old Boys, Randy wanted to expand his audience, which meant trying to make his unique voice more broad. The result was Short People. Randy's only widely commercially successful song as a recording artist. Sung from the point of view of someone who thinks short people got no reason to live, the song is still satire of unfounded prejudice, but it feels more like a joke than commentary. Girl Marcus says, The record was bland, Newman's edge was off, as if he were afraid he might lose his new fans if he challenged them. Randy's burgeoning cult had nothing to do with the song's chart success, in terms of his career, it was clearly a fluke. Newman had, far more perfectly than anyone could have expected, fallen into the trap of acclaim. Randy took his exaggeration for the sake of satire just a touch too far in short people, and people bought it as a novelty, a sentiment that was untrue to the rest of Randy's catalog. Randy is not a novelty songwriter. He is at his best when he is not playing for the joke, but playing the character. On seeing Randy live, Girl Marcus says, Except in its weaker moments, this was not satire. It was a whole world, irresistibly funny and extremely uncomfortable. Like W.C. Fields with the Hollywood varnish rubbed off. But the laughter was not smug, and the scariness of the songs was not smug on Newman's part, but simply presented as what he did for a living. What he did better than anyone else. And it is somewhat because of Randy's anonymity that he is able to portray these characters. 
even in songs that Randy has said are autobiographical, like Dixie Flyer or I Miss You, you still get a sense of detachment. He says, I can do personal stuff because no one gives a shit. No one knows who the hell I am. But Sinatra can't sing Suzanne because he's somebody. Kevin Currier explains, Since Newman was a nobody, he could be anybody in his songs, a luxury Frank Sinatra, with all his fame, couldn't afford. The mask allows Randy to say and explore things that no other artist would be able to do. And because of that, he encourages the listener to confront hard and unexpected problems. Kevin Currier says, Most songs invite us to identify with the performer, even encourage us to sing along with him. But Newman goes against the grain, to the point where we have to ask ourselves just what we are saying when we sing a Randy Newman song. Newman demands that we ask that question, and acknowledge that he situated us in an uneasy place. Let's take a break from Randy's psyche for a moment and look at his music. As he was growing up, Randy idolized the musicianship of people like Ray Charles and Fats Domino. You can hear elements of Delta Blues, Ragtime, and New Orleans R&B in his music that he adopted from their style. He says of Ray Charles specifically, I think I got it in my head and tried to sound like him. It's like a template for what I've done all my life. But Randy also revered the pop songwriters of his time. In particular, he mentions Carole King quite often when he's talking about early inspirations. The Staffords explain, Randy looked on their works and despaired. What I did for years was try to be Carole King, he said. When I started at 16, Carole King was just the greatest, I thought, and still do. And when Randy first started out, he did attempt to write straightforward pop hits. He says, when I wrote I've Been Wrong Before and Just One Smile and Nobody Needs Your Love, my publisher at the time, Aaron Schroeder, was so happy because they were songs with hooks and it looked like I was going to earn some money. But I didn't continue doing it. I'm not saying I could have written millions of hit songs if I decided to. That's a talent I may not have. Bert Bacharach has it. He knows where the gold is. My uncle Lionel used to say Burt Bacharach's songs sound like third oboe parts. He was rough. But when Bacharach gets his hook, he knows it's there. I've come to appreciate him. Randy wasn't happy with writing traditional pop songs. It didn't fit with his personality or what he wanted to talk about in his music. He says, I reached a point where I was writing relatively conventional songs. Musically, they were alright but it wasn't what I was responding to in literature and television and comedy. It was resistance on my part to doing I love you, why don't you love me lyrics. One day, I just didn't want to do that anymore. Other people did it better, Rogers and Hart, Carol King, Lieber and Stoller. My literary sensibility was more than that, just as Paul Simon's is. I wanted to write what I was interested in. Randy cites his early song, Simon Smith and the Amazing Dancing Bear, as his first time finding his true voice, saying it was the first time I wasn't trying to be Carole King. I don't know where that song came from. It was the first one like that. The Staffords explain, it was a liberating experience and made him realize that writing conventional pop songs had been a constraint. I know more words than that, he said. However, this early experience with writing pop songs did give Randy an important lesson in musicality that he would use in his career. The effectiveness of simplicity. Randy says, A lot of my tunes, if you write them down, are just three notes, but they serve what I'm trying to do. The Staffords explain further, Randy doesn't usually bother with much harmonic complexities, not in his songs anyway. If three or four chords were good enough for Fats Domino and Ray Charles, they're good enough for him. A lot of the time, he's happy letting five follow two and one follow five. There are of course exceptions to this, and that's not to say that Randy is a slouch as a composer. Just take a look at any of his film scores and you'll see his depth of musical knowledge. But he also recognizes that if you are trying to get a complicated or meaningful thought across in a three minute song, the music can't get in the way of that. The Staffords say, 
Randy's records tended to avoid fancy effects. To their credit, they usually sounded like a man singing in a room accompanied by some musicians. Impeccably recorded, but never fancy. The simplicity of his music pairs perfectly with the complexity of his lyrics. It is part of the character of the song. The spiraling riff of Mama Told Me Not To Come reflects the overwhelmed character's anxiety of being at a debaucherous party. The legato arpeggios of Guilty imitate a confessional drunkard slurring his words, or the bombastic driving chords of I Love LA for the song's prideful narrator. They all lend to the story of the song. Or, Randy can use the music to juxtapose the message of the song, like the beautiful music that accompanies Sail Away, as mentioned earlier, or the dreamy carnival music that tells the grotesque story of Davy the Fat Boy. So the music has to be part of the character of the song and help tell its story, either by directing the listener to an aspect of the character, or painting a backdrop that exaggerates them, something that I tried to do in my song. In discussing Randy's film music, Girl Marcus explains it like this. He uses the familiarity of the music to set us in the moods and situations the music automatically calls up. We respond in predictable ways to the music, and as we do, Newman's words and his singing pull us in other directions, or shift the story just enough to make it new. The music defines for us the way we want it to be, the way the movies have told us it is, and then Newman tells us how it looks to him. The tension that comes is almost never facile, because the movie dreams the music evokes are real to him too, and because he loves the music itself. It is not merely a device, but at the heart of the matter. Not just half of his strategy, but half of his aesthetic. So we've talked about how Randy uses his music and words to create complex and potent characters for his songs, but what about Randy himself? Randy rarely writes from his own point of view, some notable exceptions being Dixie Flyer, which is basically a Newman family history, and I Miss You about his lingering feelings for his first wife. However, you can't help but get the feeling that you know more about Randy as a person than you would think after listening to his music. He says, Many people want personal confessions. Maybe that's why I don't sell two million records. In fact, I always thought people could tell what I was like for my stuff more easily than they could tell about a confessional songwriter. I don't know what Fogelberg is like from his songs. You can tell what I'm like. I found a way to write about myself that I don't object to. I lied. When listening to Randy's music, you get a sense of who he is as a person. And more importantly, it connects with people who have the same ideologies or idiosyncrasies that he has. He says, I feel like an outsider, a little bit, looking in. I always try to be like everybody else. But I don't think I ever quite succeeded. It's not exceptionalism in the small sense of being exceptional. I just couldn't seem to do simple things. I don't feel absolutely comfortable on the planet. And this is what gave Randy his cult following. He spoke to ideas that connected with certain people in a way that hadn't before with other songwriters. And Randy connected with his fans as well. We talked about him wanting a wider audience after Good Old Boys, but in reflecting on it, Randy said this, Maybe in a way what I wanted, more than money or sales or fame, was praise. And now that I've got it, it seemed I'm worried I won't get it again. But it probably isn't as important to me as it was. Writing, although I know it is more important, is rough. Performing is so easy, so immediately rewarding. I had a talk with Nielsen once and I thought he was crazy. He said he didn't want to perform because he thought the audience would sway him unduly about his songs. Now I'm convinced he was totally crazy. Or it might be that performing is so easy and lucrative that I'm getting the gratification that I used to get from writing without all the grief. Which brings us to another characteristic of Randy. Though he is an amazing writer, it's hard to tell whether he loves writing or hates it. He said, I think I don't like work but I always feel better when I'm doing it. Which is not the same as finding comfort there. If you bury yourself in something, 
it's an excuse for not having a life. He also said, I never write 24 hours a day. I can't do that. I never get an idea when I'm not sitting down to work. Never. I'm so doctrinaire about it that I probably exclude them. I don't like thinking about it when I'm not working. I work from 9 in the morning until about 1 tops, and I try not to think about it the rest of the day. It doesn't do me any good. Randy seems to live the old adage, I hate writing, but I love having written. Or as Randy would put it, it's not like I love what I do. I have to force myself to do it. I love having written something, but I don't love the writing process. This is something that I, like many other writers, also have to admit about myself from time to time. But Randy is persistent, continuing to release albums into his 70s. Although he would often take long breaks between songwriting projects, he would always return, no matter how hard it was. As he says, starting can be difficult. The real secret to that, like so much else, is stamina, hanging in there and showing up every day. In the end, as much as it may pain him to do it, Randy does love songwriting. One of my favorite journalists, John Ronson, is also a Randy Newman superfan. He did a short documentary on Randy, and in their interview, Randy had this to say, There isn't anything more important to me than writing well. If you can give me something, if I could be guaranteed that I could go in every day and write something that I liked, that's what I'd take over anything. No doubt about that. I got no doubt about it. Why? asked John. Randy said, Because it's how I judge myself and how I feel best. Till the next one comes, and the next.
next one comes till the next one comes along thank you for watching this video from the songwriters workshop like I said, Randy is one of my favorite songwriters, so I very much enjoyed learning more about his music and trying to find some semblance of his wit and inventiveness in my own songwriting. It is a skill I would like to develop further and inject into more of my songs. Please be sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for more videos in the future. I'll see you at the next song.